Today's show is brought to you in part by support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. In appreciation of our guests' participation, we have made a contribution to the following organization on their behalf. The United Fund. We can't simply believe in equality in education. We have to create it. For more information, please visit uncf.org. Spontaneous creativity in a high-level expert musician is associated with this kind of shutdown or deactivation or inhibition, depending on your viewpoint, of areas of the prefrontal cortex that we think are linked to conscious self-monitoring and effortful planning. And so in a way, we view this as the sort of self-censoring mechanisms of the brain being lifted away when you are improvising, maybe to promote the flow of novel ideas. Welcome to Sing for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week, we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. This week, we'll be talking with jazz guitar legend and 20-time Grammy winner Pat Metheny about the opening track from his 1976 debut album of the same name, Bright Size Life. Also joining us is neuroscientist and surgeon Dr. Charles Lim, Dr. Lim has spearheaded research on the neural basis of musical creativity and the impact of cochlear implants on music perception in the hearing impaired. The title of this week's episode on the show is Bright Size Life, What Neuroimaging Reveals About Improvisation and Creativity in Music. Hello, Pat and Charles. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, I've really been looking forward to this one. Pat, I'm a reformed jazz guitar player. (laughs) <laughs> uh, or a quitter, depending on how you look at it. So there's a, a lot I want to ask you. Um, I was hoping you could shed some light on a story I heard about you when I was a teenager. And I was, I was taking a summer jazz guitar workshop, actually, with my hero, and maybe yours too, Jim Hall. The, at lunch, the facilitator said, he said, you know, Pat Matheny, when he was at the University of Miami, he was having trouble playing in the key of D-flat. And so... In response to that, he would only take gigs so long as every tune could be called in D-flat. And I really had a hard time reconciling that with my image of you, which is (laughs) one that exudes pure joy. And to do something so masochistic (laughs) and devoid of pleasure and aesthetic, it really puzzled me. So is it true? You know, I've heard some weird stories over the years of things that people have attributed to this or that, that is 100% fiction there. <laughs> okay. Not, o- not only that, I mean, by that time, I would have been kind of well through the ringer of a couple Kansas City guys that I was playing with kind of in my you know years playing around town before I got to Miami, where one guy in particular, an incredible musician named Russ Long, willfully would play every song in a different key every single time we played it. Oh, man. Uh, Making the point that you don't really know a song until you can play it in all 12 keys. And that that was something that certainly by the time I would have gotten to Miami would have been uh, well in my... uh, zone of of what is a required activity if, if you're going to be able to hang so no nothing nothing about that yeah i mean true. well maybe it was meant to be motivational i mean if nothing else it just terrified me so <laughs> anyhow it, was, it makes for good jazz mythology knowing jim i wouldn't have been surprised if he wouldn't have said in his jim like way well haven't you ever heard of a capo yeah, I know. It's so funny. Like for such a cerebral player, he had like this real old kind of showbiz yeah. uh, sense of humor, sticky. Totally, kind of thing. totally. Well, anyhow, so you were in Florida around what, 74, 75? 72, 73. And that's where you met Jaco Pastores? That's where I met Jaco, yeah. So we, we fast forward a couple years and then we're recording your first record, Bright Size Life. Um, what's so striking to me about you and this record is that how you arrived on the scene with such a well-formed and and unique sound, you know, one that to me anyway, has no obvious forebears. And 
I've read that Wes Montgomery was a huge influence on you. And, and it's like, I don't, I, I don't hear Wes Montgomery. I mean, like, I don't even hear horn players. I hear Joni Mitchell and dare I say Santana. I just hear something totally different and open and the form feels atypical. So it really feels like it kicks the door open. And when we bring Dr. Lim into the fold, I, I want to hear what could possibly account for that from a a neuroscience point of view. But before we do, I'm as a musician and a fan, I'm really curious to hear what you remember about that period. Well, first of all, thank you, because embedded in your description, there were several really nice compliments, and I really do appreciate that. It's funny looking back on it now, you know, my goal at that time really was, first of all, to just try to be a good musician and to fill in so many blanks that I was, and even now I'm still filling in blanks of stuff that makes up the language. But I was very lucky. Um, you know, my favorite band of that era was the Gary Burton Quartet. And, uh, you know, it was a band that kind of redefined so many things. And, you know, I was kind of exactly the right age to be not only influenced by the sound of what they were doing, but also, I would say, the philosophy of of that era, which was a very open-minded, very progressive era in music in general. Mm. And Gary's band somehow, you know, really represented everything about that. And people talk a lot about Bitches Brew, which is around that mm -hmm. era, the famous Miles Davis record. Yep. You know, Gary's thing was even a couple years before that, really. Um, and, and what I'm referring to there is just the, the whole idea of sort of all music being available within the realm of what that community of improvising musicians could represent and have access to. You know, that was a, a real ideal for me. And in fact, joining the Gary Burton Quartet would be at age 15 or 16 for me the same as if I was going to join the Beatles. You know, I mean, that was it for yeah. me. And as it turned out, right around then, um, 1973, I had an opportunity to uh, do a couple performances with Gary and not long after that he hired me to be in the band mm. and being around Gary for a few years was the absolute greatest thing that ever could have happened to me mm. and when it happened that I joined Gary's band Gary at that point had just uh, started a relationship with ECM Records in Germany yep. the guy that runs ECM heard me and heard Gary talking about me and offered me the chance to make a record and of course, at age 18 or 19, that's like, you know, yeah, let's do it tomorrow. Um, Gary's thing was, no, you might only be able to make one record mm. in your entire life, and I don't want you to make the same mistake I made. You wait until you've got a thing and then make that mm. first record because you're only going to be able to make that record one time. And, you know, the guy, the ECM producer guy had suggested maybe that I would play with Dave Holland and Jack DeJanet mm. and, you know, the kind of ECM, which I was like, yeah, that'd be so great. And Gary, I mean, I have to really give him a lot of credit, was like, you know, you've got this great band that I've heard with this bass player who nobody had ever heard of at that time, Jocko, and, you know, Moses, and, you know, I've heard a couple of your tunes. You should really work on that. And with the sort of mantra, you may only make one record in your entire life, and this should be it. So that started a process which actually lasted over a year of me sort of writing tunes, showing them to Gary, him being pretty brutal because he was and is in the best possible way. Um, and that all led to, you know, the recording of, of Bright Size Life, which was significantly different than it might have been 18 months earlier. I mean, you know, at that age, everything is kind of unfolding very quickly. And, um, you know, my thing, really, when I think about it from the time I was 15 and 16 playing around Kansas City with a lot of, you know, kind of organ trio type things or a quartet or a quintet with one horn mm. player and, and so forth, you know, but playing like Stanley Turrentine tunes and even like, mm -hmm. you know, Carol King tunes of the time, mm. you know, in kind of a Grant Green kind of thing. And then, you know, that style, 
all the way to the the kind of interests that I had in like Ornett stuff and of course Gary's mm -hmm. thing, which I mentioned, to suddenly being in that world and, you know, a lot of stuff in between. When I think about it now, this was all compressed in six or nine months, really. <laughs> yeah. You know, it seemed like a really long time at that time, but it was, it was a, a short time from, uh, you know, the time I went to Miami, met Jocko, joined Gary's band to mm. making a record. I mean, at the time, it seemed like 20 years, but it was like, you know, 18 months or something. So, And so, you know, you're the first instrumentalist we've had on the show. And, you know, you're talking about that time period when you're writing those tunes and showing them to Gary Burton. I mean, could you talk a little bit about your composition process and what went into it? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me right around that period, I realized that there was a kind of thing I wanted to be able to get to as an improviser that was difficult for me to reconcile with playing on a blues in an organ trio or playing a standard with a quartet, that kind of stuff. There was just this air, this actually quite gigantic area of interest for me that I really was unable to find an environment to explore. So mm. it was kind of a pragmatic thing for me to, to dive in there and start writing tunes with the idea specifically of, I want to be able to, to play in these areas. And, you know, I don't know how deep you would want to go into that, but I mean, a lot of it has to do with growing up where I grew up and just kind of the nature of the way that I was hearing things. Playing on triads was something really cool to me. I mean, by that, mm -hmm. I mean like real open kind of chords. It wasn't, you know, like that I, I never felt like it was an either or thing. And that's what you hear in that tune. Like a lot of that tune, it doesn't have a lot of those, the jazz character of the, of the extensions on the chords and stuff like that. And, and a lot of it is sort of upper structures that are altered by the way the bass notes are moving around. Okay. And of course that was a thing that was quite, uh, you know, notable about the pop music of that era. Um, you know, there was a lot of diatonic activity, meaning staying in one key, but but yep. the bass notes were moving around. And, and that yeah. was something I really liked. And also, I found that it was kind of an area that I was interested in as an improviser that it turned out was really hard for the hardcore bebop guys to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've kind of taken a weird kind of interest over the years at watching, you know, like really accomplished players have a real hard time with what to do on a tune like Bright Size Life, mm -hmm. because you can't exactly play like bebop on it. But on the other hand, if you don't know that, you also can't play on it. I mean, it's yeah. a it's a weird sort of in-between zone. I mean, much less so now, because I mean, here we are 50 years almost later, it's completely mm -hmm. absorbed into the vocabulary. But at that moment, you know, in 1973, 74, it was mm -hmm. like, wow, you know, that was a, a different kind of thing. Now, isn't the whole reason why Joni Mitchell wanted to bring Jocko into her band was because she wanted a bass player who wasn't playing the root notes? <laughs> well, whether she wanted it that or not, that's definitely what, that's she, what she got. got. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I... I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. I do remember her talking about how she liked the fact that Jocko was not doing the, uh, you know, normal, I think she called them polka dots, mm. you know, at the bottom of the chords. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, and of course we know what she means by that, the boom, ba boom thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that would have been the sort of first uh, impulse that a bass player would have with her tunes. And Jocko mm -hmm. was certainly not doing that. Yesterday, I, I watched that video of y you and Joni and Jocko and Michael Brecker, and you're playing the Santa Barbara Bowl, and I just really regret having been born only two years earlier, because that's, <laughs> that's the kind of band I would like to see in an amphitheater. I, I'm curious, do you remember those rehearsals, how you learned her tunes? Because she has you know, so many of those intuitive tunings that she came up with and stuff. For me, you know, it was pretty straight ahead. I mean, her thing is, however she arrived at those particular sounds, 
it's not like it's um, Schoenberg or something. I mean, yeah, it's sure. St- <laughs> it's still, it's still basically we're talking about like, okay, that's a major chord, that's a minor yeah. chord, that you know, and so mm-hmm. forth. So it wasn't there wasn't too much of a of a, a learning curve in a, in a way in that respect. It, you know, the the learning curve for that band actually, I would say, was the restraint factor required from all of us because it was a little bit like getting a Ferrari to to drive around the block in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, and on the other hand... Who's got the Ferrari, you or Joni? The whole... No, I mean the band. The band relative to her fundamental musical vocabulary. Got it. Um, And at the same time, playing simple is, for me, really one of the hardest things to get good Ferrari type musicians to, to do. Um, you know, it's very, it's actually much easier to find guys who can play really, really complicated stuff than guys who can play really good, simple stuff and then turn around and also play complicated stuff. That's kind of the holy grail thing for me that I still struggle to find. No, for sure. And I also read that Jocko was the musical director in that band, but he showed up to rehearsals two weeks after you guys had already started. You know, the, the you know that general area of of the Jocko mystique and uh, the Charlie Parker story starring Jocko is a tough one for me because honestly, he was the only other musician I had ever met who was like me. And, you know, some people know, you know, I mean, I've never even had a drink, you know, or I've never tried any drugs or anything at all, not for any moral reasons. I was just never interested in it and had the benefit of being around, or I don't know, benefit, the experience of being around a lot of musicians at a very young age who were not doing well. And I I noticed as the night wore on, it just got worse. So it was kind of a practical thing for me. And Jocko was just like that. And during the time of Bright Side's life and so forth, he was like that too. When he joined Weather Report, he became an almost unrecognizable person to me, Mm. um, you know, for a variety of reasons related to to that stuff. And, um, you know, Charles would probably be able to talk about some of those aspects of having parents who are alcoholics and so forth and what happens, you know, on even a molecular level once you get to there. But I mean, Jocko was at that point at, by the time we reunited to do the Joni thing. And, um, you know, there were aspects of that tour actually, you know, if I have to pick the, 50 greatest musical experiences I've ever had. Mm-hmm. I don't think that any of that tour would rise to, to that yeah. level. I mean, you know, I got to play with Billy Higgins a lot, you know, and when I think about what that is or Herbie or, you know, now Chick or, you know, millions of nights with incredible musicians really getting to some stuff, I'm not sure that we quite got to that in that band. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's that's really uh, refreshing to hear that because so much goes into the Jocko mythology and to hear that he, he wasn't displaying that erratic behavior when you were playing with him. It, Not it, at all. Like he existed without it. It's, it's satisfying to hear as a fan. But like you said, you know, maybe this is as good an opportunity as any to, to start talking about the science of what's going on because Dr. Lim, I've watched your TED talk. I've listened to a, a, a lecture I have so many questions about improvisation, the nature of improvisation, how we measure it, inhibition, and inhibition pops up when I think about mood altering drugs and stuff like that, which isn't, I by no means do I intend to drive this episode towards that. Could you give us um, a little background about what you do, what your research is, the hypotheses that inform it? Of course. Yeah. Let me try it. First of all, let me just say, um, listening to Pat talk about his musical upbringing is always for me is uh, it's very humbling, but also I think uh, informative because it reminds me of all the different paths that people take to become who they are. And you know, there's some analogies for me directly as to why I went into surgery as opposed to music because I was somebody who loved music yet didn't have the sort of the fierce dedication to practicing into the talent that Pat was sculpting so that by the time of him being a late teenager, he could put out Bright Size Life. 
And for me, it was always a struggle to figure out how to reconcile this deep interest I had in sound with what to do with my time and this planet. And um, having two parents that were surgeons, I actually naturally avoided wanting to become a surgeon because I, I wanted to find my own path. Yeah. And eventually when I was in medicine and I recognized that there was a field of medicine that involved sound and hearing, I was sort of off to the races. But then a funny thing happened. I, I was interested in music as a field of study, yet there was almost no uh, pre-existing uh, field of study. I mean, like the scientific study of music was kind of um, in, in, it was very simple at that time, certainly from a clinical perspective of people taking care of, of people that couldn't hear well or try to understand how it is that we can hear music. We knew very little. And so what I sort of have spent the past maybe 20 years or so trying to figure out is how to take a love of music, but to not use it to appreciate it or view it as entertainment or to even necessarily try to play better, which I do all those things, but to view it as maybe the highest achievement of the human brain. And then to understand how is it possible that the human brain can do these things? And then maybe more importantly, what does it say about what it means to be human? Because I don't view these things as of sort of one-offs that just take place in jazz clubs. I view them as actually fundamental to maybe the human species, maybe maybe a part of the reason why we've been able to survive is because we've been able to create. And so listening to, to Pat talk about sort of how he came to be uh, as a musician and you know what I know of is all the hours of, of work that went into it makes me understand a little bit more about how the human brain gets refined over time. You know, it's an iterative process. The, the brain isn't born a, a musical genius. It's it's it becomes one maybe over the time of a lifetime by 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 dedication by love by by craft and by studying but also by thinking and then what's happening as these experiences are happening sort of the behind the scenes circuitry of the brain is that there's something called neuroplasticity the the brain is actually changing as you acquire these not just skills but also these perspectives on life and all of it kind of becomes a soup this kind of neurological biological soup that enables you to produce something that's really rich. And so my experiments have been kind of geared at trying to reflect that question of how it is possible that humans can come up with a new idea. Wow. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can describe what, what I've seen, but, and, uh, I encourage our listeners to watch your Ted talk and, you know, you put a jazz musician inside, uh, an fMRI scanner and and uh, give them a keyboard and you ask them you you give them a phrase a melodic phrase to memorize and they play that and you take a picture of the brain and then you do the same thing after they've they've improvised and you analyze the differences it's, does that sum it up properly it does and you know I think part of the danger here is to understand some of the limitations of where neuroscience is with respect to music meaning that mm. you know we're very far from understanding the the genius of, of Pat's music right I think where we are is being able to maybe articulate the proper questions I just want to stop you right there and I want to say it is so encouraging to hear a scientist say that because I think it's so important that people understand that science is a process it's not a body of facts and I think there's a, a real disconnect sometimes between the public and practitioners of medicine, scientists, that there's an authority thing going on. And to hear you say, like, it's teaching us the questions and you're approaching it with less than absolute certainty, it's it's really encouraging to hear. Uh, well, well, thanks for saying that. But I, I can't imagine as a scientist feeling any other way. In fact, it doesn't in the same way that music is humbling, science is humbling because mm -hmm. the world is always full of so many more things that we don't know than things that we do know. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I was talking to my, ch my children who are doing this virtual school and they kind of view science as a subject, like it's a, yeah. like it's a, a, a sort of catalog of information that they're trying to learn. And I said, oh, actually, it's really not that at all. It's a process. It's a process mm -hmm. of trying to phrase a question properly and then trying to figure out how you answer it. And so one thing we're seeing is that we can ask questions that are musically relevant and we can start to dig beneath the surface and try to get to the truth of what's happening. But I think that there's still a large gap that exists between the kind of findings where a scientist says, oh, this is interesting, and where a musician says, wow, this is something that I can really um, take with me to the stage or that will affect how I'm composing. Because there's, you know, I think there's different purposes let me give you an analogy. Let's say you are 
a chef and you're cooking a delicious meal, your person in sitting in your restaurant eating that doesn't need to know all of the food science that went into your preparation of that meal. They just mm-hmm. eat it and one bite and they, they, they taste it and it's amazing. In the same way that when you hear the first measure of Bright Size Life, you're like, wow, what was that? Where did that come from? Mm-hmm. So you don't need the science to have the wondrous musical experience. Yet, if the science can start to flesh out sort of the, I think, maybe overarching relevance of why music matters, then I think we're really onto something. And I'm sure Pat's had this experience traveling all around the world that music changes the well-being of the listener in ways that are profound. But we don't understand how or why that happens from a medical perspective. Could you talk a little bit about what you have uncovered that, that speaks to that? Some of these questions about why it reaches people the way that it does and has the impact that it does and what theories you had going in, which ones were, which ones were right and which ones were wrong? Yeah, let me say the following. So when you, whenever you do a scientific study of something like jazz improvisation, which is by its very nature kind of uncontrolled, you kind of set up a scientific paradigm where you are designing tasks and control conditions that are kind of very necessarily confined to certain things. And if you're going to study a jazz musician improvising, you need to give them an environment musically and also physically where they can actually successfully do that. And so we sort of set up a way for them to be able to improvise on the blues while we're measuring their brain activity that I think works pretty well. And what we found so far, if you can kind of boil it down, there's this amazing amalgam of risk-taking, but also kind of autobiographical identity seeking that's happening in jazz music. And I think that we're seeing this in the brain activity. We're seeing that when you turn off these conscious self-monitoring areas, you are in fact actually allowing your, your brain is allowing yourself to take risks. And I, I think that that's one of the things that really separates the expert from the novice is that the novice can't do that. They are always getting in their own way because they're worried about how to play it. What, how does it sound? The judgment, et cetera, mm. et cetera. And it's not that experts may not think about this is that they don't have to de- devote as much neural resources to that. And Got the way it. I like to think of it is that the brain in an expert jazz musician can spend more time on conceiving ideas and less time on executing them. Whereas a novice brain is probably spending a lot of time just executing ideas rather than conceiving ideas. Got it. And so, you know, I think that when we think about why that matters to me, it's not just that this is what happens in a jazz musician. It's that it's probably what happens in all forms of spontaneous creativity that involve flow states. And every human being on this planet has been in that situation where they enter a flow state where their brain is you know, processing really efficiently, really optimally, and generating ideas. And that, to me, is maybe the core of sort of human innovation and ingenuity. Yeah, man. Pat, have you submitted to this? Have you had your brain scanned? <laughs> I, so far, I have not. And that is something that I look forward to doing at some point. I always really enjoy these opportunities to listen to to Dr. Lim, so much of what he's saying just is so exactly on the money to, you know, after 50 years now of, of being a, a, a musician, it's, it's right on. And, and, you know, also the last bit of what he was saying is something that to me is really significant. We all experience this in our own ways, you know, even this conversation we're having right now. I mean, you know, Matt, you're not thinking about what your tongue is doing or, you know, you're not having to reach for a verb or a noun. We're just doing the thing. I mean, you're unlike when you were in the high school big band and you were nervous about whether that was a D minor seven flat five or a regular D minor seven. And, Mm -hmm. oh my God, what am I going to play? You know, in, in the context of speaking the English language, this is not an issue for you. So you can get right to it. And, you know, improvising musicians are a fantastic kind of canary in the coal mine for studying Mm -hmm. this because Mm -hmm. the job is to go out there every night and play different stuff and do it at a high level. And there aren't too many occupations that that is like embedded in the job description. I often describe what we're doing more as a symptom than a destination in a way. Um, You know, and that's a little bit like what Dr. Lim was just saying too. It's sort of like, the ability that one has to be able to play autumn leaves or something, Mm -hmm. 
infinity times is not unlike the ability that a person who has a narrative skill or gift to be able to make up stories, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. And we all know people like that. And I know that Dr. Lim has studied rappers, for instance, you know, who yeah. have like incredible reservoirs of ideas in that department. And what I really like about what Dr. Lim is saying is this sort of idea of this being kind of what makes us us, you know? And mm -hmm. more and more, I, I really see... You know, even the, the sound itself is kind of an envelope for what the real thing is, which is has to do with what our humanity is. It has to do with soul and consciousness. And I mean, these are areas that are still mysterious, you know, both to science, music and humans. You know, we can talk a lot, but there's a door we're going to get to that is still a little bit yet to be, uh, you know, opened. And maybe this gets, I, I love this idea of viewing mu music as kind of the, the envelope, but that it's actually conveying something that is, um, you know, not at all confined to, to sound or music. Well, anytime I do an experiment involving music, the brain is really robustly stimulated. It's not just the auditory parts of the brain that light up. And so that's, that's one thing that you need to know immediately. When you hear music, many parts of your brain are lighting up. And you know, we mm. see activity in people that are lying perfectly still in their motor areas, their memory areas, their emotional areas, their cognitive areas, and so forth. And so it's a really robust stimulus for the brain. And you know, that alone should tell, hopefully, our uh, you know, educational policymakers that music and the arts more broadly should by, you know, by no means be removed or diminished in schools. In fact, it may be one of the best most effective ways to directly stimulate the brain. And so to me, it's a, it's a shame that somehow we have decided that these things are, are optional in some cases. You know, human society and human civilization has not viewed this as optional, which is why the arts persist despite no obvious clear survival advantage. There's always been music, every culture, every historical period, there's always been music. It's a part of what it means to be human. And I think it this pertains to how our brain is processing uh, stimuli. So one way to think about the brain is that it's an organ whose job is to find the patterns in chaos. And the reason for that is because we need to survive. And so if you think about the very primitive early brain, you know, the goal is to survive. And the way you survive is by extracting relevance out of what appears to be chaos. And so the brains become very good at seeking patterns. Um, well, music is kind of the ultimate form of pattern sound. You know, I, I describe it as the highest form of sound. I mean, it's it's patterned, it's organized and patterned in so many different uh, trajectories and vectors um, that I think the brain latches onto it in a very sort of uh, innate and robust manner. And it means something to the brain to have all this kind of information coming at it. And so one thing you'll see in an improvisational musician is not only is the brain turning off some of these conscious self-monitoring areas that might impede our flow, but it's also ramping up areas of sensory motor processing. And this is kind of interesting. Like the creative brain directs more blood to regions involved in sensory processing while it's improvising in comparison to when it's doing something memorized. Yeah. And I think the most accessible ex example I would think for most people is when you have rappers who can freestyle getting those scans. And it was such a brilliant experiment. You give them what you give them like a word to rap on and then they just kind of have to do it right on the spot. Yeah. You know, and that goes back to what I was saying about designing an experiment that feels right. And, you know, we, we call this in science, we call it ecological validity, but the idea is that the experiment should be based on something natural for the musician. So in jazz, we use the blues. Well, rappers, I, when we were studying rappers, I spent a lot of time just trying to learn about the culture of freestyle rap and how it is possible that they do what they do. And in many ways, rap serves some of the same sort of musical social functions that jazz served 60 years ago. So there's a lot of overlap and analogs between these art forms. But there's something in the uh, sort of freestyle rap community that's, you know, it's called the word game. But basically one, one person sets up a beat with a sort of beatbox kind of situation. And then another person provides a word. And then the rapper feeds that word into the rhyme and they kind of go on. It's just a way to sort of test your skill with incorporating new rhymes. And so we essentially had 
rappers do that in the fMRI scanner. Okay. Can you tell me what specifically are the areas of the brain that light up? Like where are resources being directed during, during the flow state? So uh, it depends on the context, but I will tell you this, the, you can divide the brain up into regions that process information. So sound processing, visual information, sound information, touch information, and then you can divide it up into areas that are outputting a motor response and, you know, all of our movements. A lot of the brain is doing that, right? Taking in information and putting out a behavioral response. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you see all sorts of activity in those areas of the brain, but then there's also these sort of kind of like motherboard or, or master controller regions that are kind of directing traffic in the brain. And then there's also the opposite. There's these more primitive areas that are involved in, in things that are uh, more animal, you know, more primal, things like fear and, and arousal, you know. Mm-hmm. And all of these areas play an important role in music. In fact, that's why I think music is sort of the heady concoction that it is, because it gets us at both the primitive and the sort of sublime and ultra cognitive mm. levels it hits at every level yeah that's great yeah to to follow up on some of the really interesting points dr lim was saying you know an area of interest for me is you know we're kind of in this world now where people talk about spectrum type people you know and autism is a word that's used and there's a really interesting book that came out not long ago called the pattern seekers how autism drives human invention his premise is that he even kind of dates it, and I hope I'm getting this right, to about 70,000 years ago, there was a, a, a kind of, I don't know if you would call it a step in our evolution, but where this idea of really becoming experts at, at recognizing patterns kind of kicked into a new level. But yeah, so much of what it is to be a good musician, of course, the hardware part of it is the listening thing for sure. But sort of on the software side, okay, so you've received this information. What are you going to do with it? And from a musician standpoint, you know, I mean, I'm standing on stage with incredible musicians who are generating massive amounts of information. And You know, I think that when I look around the community of musicians, of the people who I would say are the the musicians that I love playing with the most, yes, they're good listeners who are capable of sort of understanding, I mean, whatever that word understanding might mean, the, the material, which of course, you know, if you keep going further and further into what that might be in our dialect, there are patterns there. There are harmonic patterns, there are rhythmic patterns, there are elements that we're going to find at some very low level even, an incredibly refined level even, a grid that we, we could say, okay, that's happening on the... 31st, 32nd note of a, you know, a very fine grid or whatever. I mean, there's this whole level of stuff going on that somehow really you could break it down and do people do, uh, you know, you people transcribe our solos and all that and really, you know, go into detail about it and then analyze it kind of looking for what I guess we could call patterns. And um, so to hear Dr. Lim actually really vocalize what that is, uh, you know, is, is really quite interesting. One of your lectures, you'd said something like, uh, it, it, where language is concerned, it's not like I can pick up a saxophone and say, can you go get me a loaf of bread at the store? You know, but I can't help but wonder if on some level notes and phrases rhythmic patterns that symbolically they do represent something to us. Do you have any insight into that phenomenon? You know, I think the overlaps and parallels between music and language are many. They're numerous and some of them are very obvious and some of them are not. I think the way I have started to view this is that both music and language are maybe two of the highest capacities of the auditory brain. And what they are are sort of parallel systems that allow us to use sound for communication. And it's really different kinds of information that is being communicated by each one. So, for example, this conversation that we are having is best conveyed by conversation, meaning I think if the three of us each picked up our instruments and started playing, I mean, it might be fun, but I don't think we would have gotten the same information out of it. And that's because speech, 
is the best medium we have to convey specific propositional thought. Music is, I think, not good at that at all. What it is really good at, though, is conveying emotion. It's conveying the experience of what it sounded like to be alive in that moment for the musician. And so I think from that viewpoint, there's a, um, a lesson there. You know, there's a kind of a debate in the scientific community about whether language predates music or, or vice versa. And while initially I thought that, you know, it was almost a given that language must have predated music, I, I'm no longer so sure about that. Because I think that some of the most very basic patterns, you know, regular time intervals that are essentially rhythms, may be some of the things that the auditory brain responded to first, well before things like syntax and vocabulary came to emerge. And so I think there's a very deep biological evolutionary reason why music persists, and it's, it's because our brains need to convey this kind of information. The other thing that's interesting, and the rapper study sort of conveyed this, is that we think of there being language areas in the brain that are active when you both hear speech, but you also produce it. We have found that in the rap studies, as opposed to the jazz improvisation studies, the language areas of the brain are active even in nonverbal communication. And so musical conversation, let's say you have two musicians improvising, trading fours. Those musicians are using language areas of their brain to have that conversation. Rappers, when they switch from doing something that's memorized to actually freestyling, their language areas go into overdrive. And so what we're seeing is that the language areas of the brain may really not just be the language areas of the brain. They really may be the auditory communication areas of the brain. And it might be invoked just as intensely by music as it is by speech, just depending on the particular context. But rapping, I mean, rapping in a a rhythmic flow, it's just as much music as it is speech, though. Yeah, absolutely. But what we're seeing is that these areas that we used to think of as just being speech-centric areas are heavily involved in both rap, as you might expect, because there's language involved, but also non-linguistic communication between musicians. We're seeing these language, so-called language areas of the brain are lighting up. Got mm-hmm. it. And so we've got this the universality of um, rhythmic phrases, but I, I was recently reading Paul Robeson wrote a an autobiography and there's an appendix at the end when he talks about at some point in his life, he got into, I guess he was banned from performing maybe for his ties to communism, but he, he got into ethnomusicology and he started talking about the commonality of the pentatonic scale, you know, which is the five tone scale emerging in different cultures in different parts of the world. And to me, like that's pretty bananas, especially because it's not like all these cultures operate with a, a 12 note scale, but somehow we all arrived at this thing independent of one another with this five tone scale. And maybe this is pseudoscience, but to me that suggests that there is some sort of like basic communication going on when we, when we exchange musical ideas and phrases. Yeah, I I absolutely believe that. And music in a way it's, it's, it's a glue that binds people to one another. And in, in a way it, If music could provide a sort of a health role, um, this is something that we need to understand more. And actually, I'm I'm a co-director of something called the Sound Health Network, which is a sort of National Endowment for the Arts funded UCSF collaboration that is trying to understand and explore and augment the relationship between listening to music and feeling as if your life is better, impacting your health and wellness. And then Mm. to me, maybe this idea of linking people to one another regardless of culture, regardless of the actual language you speak, will be one of the real kind of take-home points as to why music can serve in a therapeutic way. Mm. Yeah. You know, one other aspect to the issue of how the pentatonic scale and uh, is so universal in a lot of ways that, that I think has to be taken into account is we live on Earth and we have laws of physics that are very particular to to you know the the environment that we live in and and the amount of gravity that we are forced to deal with and and mm-hmm. um you know the the nature of what music actually is i mean what sound is and what the overtone series suggests is a whole other topic that's as broad and vast and expansive 
maybe beyond even our humanity. I mean, you know, that's a whole other can of worms there that is really also fundamental to what it takes to become a good musician is to mm-hmm. understand, you know, what it means. Okay, now we divide the string in half and that's a fifth and, you know, all the way up through the overtone series. I mean, you know, it's that is a whole other dimension to all this, which is also quite quite interesting so fascinating yeah i completely agree with that i have to say you know having done surgery on people from all walks of life the anatomy on the other side of the skin is the same it's the same middle ear space and eardrums and ossicles and nerves and cochleas that are conveying this information and the brain looks the same independent of what country you're in and i really think in a way we are um we're a product of our own biology where human biology is what it is and our brains are designed to process uh, music by virtue of the way we hear, by virtue of the way we think, by virtue of the way our neurons sync up to one another in a pretty, you know, uniform way, globally speaking. Mm. Man, this is all so cool. I, I just have to embarrass myself really quick and tell you this relevant story. Um, it's relevant for two reasons. One, because it, it has to do with Jim Hall, who uh, I got into Pat because I don't think I had the discipline to learn how to play fast bebop. And I heard this guy and he was playing this beautiful music and it was so sparse. And I was like, all right, I want to do that. <laughs> and I was listening to his stuff with Jimmy Jufree and his stuff with Bill Evans. And every night, my second year of college, I used to play Undercurrent, his album mm. with uh, with Bill Evans, which is so beautiful and it's so communicative and it's these overlapping phrases. And I would play it and I had a roommate and I would play it as we were falling asleep. And I have to confess, and before you guys dismiss this as college stoner bullshit, I was totally convinced that I was hearing them speak these phrases to one another that actually had language representation. And I told my roommate who thought I was an idiot in the morning when I told him all about it. But I think it's it's really interesting. And I've carried that with me, and that could be a product of of being in the what what do you call that state right between wakefulness and sleep, Dr. Lim? Is that the theta state? Actually, I don't know exactly what you would call that. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, I've sufficiently embarrassed myself. No, no, that's great, man. I mean, you know, I uh, from from my standpoint, you know, there have been a number of really significant playing partners that I've had. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Charlie Hayden, who, in addition to everything else, was, you know, one of my very, very best friends. And... Um, you know, when we would play together, it was not unlike having a conversation with somebody that you were very close to. Uh, it was way beyond that, but the same f- kind of fabric of communication with somebody you really love was absolutely present. And, you know, I, I know that I know for sure it was that way with Jim and Bill. You know, I know mm. it. And uh, so, yeah, I think you I think you were hearing something that was really there. OK, good. Well, that's very reassuring. <laughs> well, guys, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been spectacular. Both both of you stay healthy, safe and, and have a great rest of your day. It was great talking to you, Matt and Charles. Great virtually hanging out a little bit with you. It's always inspiring, man. Uh, to you as well. Thanks for having us. Catch Pat on tour this year in support of his Grammy-nominated album, Side Eye. And for more information about Charles Lim's work, please visit the Sound Health Network website at soundhealth.ucsf.edu. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and brought to you with support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram, media by Ottavio Media and Bailey Constas, and pressed by TCB Public Relations. Special thanks to Russell Moore, Chris Nilsson, and Kamara Thomas for their help with today's show. Please be sure to subscribe to Sing for Science on your podcast platform of choice and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening. <laughs>